My name is uh, Sylvester Henderson. I work with the, um, the vocal and core area here at the college. This is actually my third year. I've done the mic testing, testing of it off now. Testing, testing, okay, all right. So, I saw some of you thought you were coming to um, hear our great speaker, Dr. Taylor, our students, and our wonderful soloist. But I got you here because I need you to enroll in the voice class. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, they probably won't come for me, but they'll probably come for Hope and Dr. James, so maybe I can kind of put my plug in at the same time. I am really welcome and honored to, um, I've been here at this college, I'm full time on another campus at Contra Costa Community College District, and I've been working part time here with my dear lone college friend, uh, Professor Pearson, Glenn Pearson here for about three years now. Uh, we've been talking to each other for 41 years. Wow. And so we've been friends for a long time. He hasn't always been nice to me though. <laughs> but I am really honored and I'm so thankful that each of you are here. Uh, we wanted uh, every semester uh, that I've been here, we try to make sure that we sponsor something, whether it's a concert or whether it's a lecture, and we always present two or three of our students from our voice classes because we're trying to continue to show the value of music as it relates to higher education. So we thought this time we would name this lecture series Urban Music in Higher Education. I'd like to thank you all for coming and attending today's event here in our music department here at College of Alameda. Now, I, you know, it was interesting. I ran into someone last night who said, I didn't know there was a, is there music at College of Alameda? I said, there's been music at College of Alameda since 1971. So the fact that that has become, is a question needs to be, uh, should I said, <laughs> corrected. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and your being here today is part of that. So by all means, hopefully you will go out and let it be known that we are here, that things are going on at College of Alameda. Things will be increasingly going on. Uh, I myself uh, just completing a sabbatical leave where I've been working on developing a uh, career technical education curriculum as an enhancement for the department to move us in the area of also vocational uh, development in music as far as placing people in actual job, with our, our music related employment and jobs. So, so that's also going to be part of it. So anyway, not to uh, labor any longer here, because I know you didn't come to hear me ramble on, but uh, let us get to the music and the students, because that is the purpose of our gathering today. But once again, let me say welcome, thank you for coming, and please do enjoy yourselves. Our first soloist from our beginning voice class is going to come and sing from the musical Barnum, The Colors of My Life, Miss Mary Jackson. Okay, that's good. Okay.
Jackson used to be a principal as well. So now that she's retired, she has another activity. <laughs> okay. Our next solo is going to be Galerdmo. Come on, Mr. Galerdmo. He's going to come and sing. Galerdmo. He's taking a singing class, and his son is taking a piano class. He's going to come and sing When I Fall in Love. Our next soloist is going to be Miss Cadesta Harris coming to sing A Change in Me.
Final student solos is going to be Mr. Brandon Whitaker. Give him a hand clap for me. Come on. Shaboot College of the theater major. So we are appreciative. So those are our four students that represented our class. Give them all another hand clap for them. They all did very well. So proud of you today. Now remember Music 117. Okay, everyone needs to learn to sing. Because it helps you with learn presentation. 
A lot of times young people right these days don't even know how to talk to you in an intelligent manner. And so learning to sing helps you learn to speak in front of people, helps you gain employment. Because when you speak in front of people, there's a certain amount of dignity that you need to have. And so it's always good to, because it helps build confidence. It also can serve as an elective credit, but it also can serve as an actual unit for your major and it's transferable. So once again, I want to thank all those students. I'm so proud of them. I am so honored uh, once again. Uh, I met Dr. Taylor um, actually through a lady who used to work here, a professional named Connie Willis. I, was, I asked her, I said, you know, I love professors. And I do. I am a person. I am connected with higher education professionals all over the world. And um, I actually ingratiate that title. And I'm very fond of the college and the university, very much so. And so I said, you know, I would like to meet a speaker who could come and talk about urban music at Lawson Olive College. And she said, um, the rest of you got to look online and look up Dr. James Lance Taylor. And I was like, man, who is Dr. James Lance Taylor? <laughs> so I went online and I looked and saw all of these articles and he's been on um, a lot of the local TV stations whenever local politicians come. And so I emailed him and uh, he was so gracious to come He's written several textbooks. He travels a lot. But the thing that really struck me was that he has a good heart. And every time I hear him talk, he always tells me that the fact that you really can't educate people of color without acknowledging their culture. And you can't educate people of color without acknowledging their culture. And part of their culture is art and music. And that's who I am. Please welcome <laughs> Dr. James Taylor. Come on. Thank you all so much. This is a wonderful turnout. Um, I'm so honored to be here and to be here with uh, Professor Henderson and Professor Pearson, uh, the chair of the de department. No, I'm just making sure because I, whenever I get up to speak, the time just goes away. As soon as I stand up, it's over. Like right now, the speech is already over. The question is, can I get done before he sits me down? Uh, I, I, I've been speaking all my life, and I tell you, I don't think I've ever gotten through a full speech my whole life. I got excited last year, went to Australia as a keynote speaker at an international event. And I'm like, wow, I got an hour. And that hour went so quick, I ended up having to be cut short in the middle of the speech. I'm like, no, it's the hour. <laughs> so I'll try to t use these uh, few minutes to, to make the best of them so we can move out of the way and receive um, our, our performance from the vocal artist, Hope Briggs, which I'm really looking forward to. I heard her warming up in the room, in the, in the green room. And I, I, you know, I said to Professor Henderson, I hear Marian Anderson when she was singing. I'm like, I hear Marian Anderson. And, and, and how many of you know that the last conversation Martin Luther King ever had before he was shot was about black music? Um, I, I want to recognize the dean as well. Again, I want to uh, recognize the dean. And before I go too much further, uh, and I'm going to come back to that question, um, is to also recognize John Handy, um, who um, I've, I've showed a video in, uh, at USF for many years on the Fillmore District and about the Fillmore District. And he's in that. And I've seen him a hundred times. So as soon as I walk in this room, I mean, I, 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 I've, never, I've never met this man before in my life. But as soon as I walk in the room, I said, I know who that is. <laughs> and, then, and then Professor Henderson introduced him. And I hope to get a chance to talk to him uh, more. Because he should be up here talking right now, not me. <laughs> I have nothing to add that, you know, t that he can't give you a, a much deeper experiential um, uh, sharing with, but uh, but it's best to ask me. So I'll do the best <laughs> I can uh, to to live up to the expectation. Uh, now, again, how many of you know that Martin Luther King's last conversation before the bullet severed his spine was about black music? Martin Luther King's last words were pretty. His last words were, "Sing it real pretty." Uh. Those are his last words. Now we can end this speech now, and you keep that for the rest of your life. That's a deep conversation to have with somebody at the restaurant. Did you know Martin Luther King's last words? were about black music? He had told a young man to sing his favorite song, Precious Lord. And, uh, and the young man said, OK. And Martin Luther King said, sing it real pretty. And then somebody told King to put, uh, make sure he brings his coat. And he said, I will. So technically, it's I will. But his last conversation <laughs> was about black music. And he said, um, uh, he said, sing it real pretty. And then the bullet uh, severed his spine. And I think it's really important to, to understand the 
the, the symbolic, I think, um, reach of that bullet um, severed Martin Luther King's spine and Martin Luther King talking about music because in a real way, I think we've been provided a lot of misinformation about black culture and its, its depth. It's so much deeper than anything you can imagine. It, its depths are deeper than anything you can talk about. Talk about God and theology. We can sit here and have a conversation about black music that runs as deep as anybody's theological conversation about the questions of God and existence. We can sit here and talk about black music for hundreds of years because of its depth and its promulgation, not just as a black art form, but its ability to be uh, transportable to other cultures throughout time. It's how you get the Buena Vista Social Club in Cuba or Celia Cruz, who is a proud Latina uh, and technically Hispanic woman uh, of Cuba. Black music and artistic expression is traceable to the African motherland. According to W.E.B. Du Bois, early research on recently freed blacks in the 1860s, after watching the Fisk University's Jubilee Singers, anybody ever heard of the Jubilee Singers? Yes. After Du Bois heard them sing, this is a, a black man with a PhD from Harvard, from Boston, I mean from uh, Massachusetts, so he doesn't know anything about the, about the plantation. He doesn't know anything about the black struggle. He's an upper class black man with a PhD from Harvard. Du Bois did not know the plantation, and he didn't know anything about the black experience until he left Boston and went down to Fisk to, be, to attend Fisk University. And at Fisk, Du Bois comes into contact with the Jubilee Singers, who were these recently manumitted slaves and their children in the 1870s who went around the world, hear me, they went around the world funding the institution. Talking about black music, urban music, higher education, I'm trying to give you the beginning of it. It begins with Du Bois and Fisk. It was considered the Harvard of the South for black America. It was Howard University before Howard was Howard. <laughs> Fisk was it. Bill Cosby helped save it a few times in the 80s. Now, we don't, you know, Bill Cosby's going the way of Harvey Weinstein and everybody else, but at one time, Bill Cosby saved of that school multiple times with his money. And everybody had forgotten about that. But uh, Du Bois felt that he himself had little competency in reading, writing, and performing songs of music. He said once when he heard these black singers come up to Connecticut, his first time he ever heard black music was when the Jubilee singers went up to Connecticut and he went across over to Massachusetts to hear them. And Du Bois's reaction was this. He says, I don't know music. He says, but I know men. He says, and I know that this music is of me, and I am of it. All right. I don't exactly know exactly what, it, what, what they're talking about, because I've never been in a plantation, but I know what they're talking about has something to do with who I am yeah. in this world and who you are as well. Real quickly, uh, the, mu the way the boys showed this sense of cultural superior, listen carefully to my language. The reason, the, the hint the subtlety of Du Bois' sense that black music was culturally superior to anything that Europe had produced was the fact that in the chapters of the souls of black folk, anybody got a copy of that book at home? Go back home and look at your book and look, open it up and look at each of, I think, about 14 chapters. And in the front of each of the 14 or 15 chapters, he has the, only the musical bars, not the words, of Negro spirituals in the souls of black folk in every chapter. And he uses them to open up each chapter as if to say, this is what matters, this music. It is superior to anything Europe has produced. And, 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 the, and, and again, this is from a black man who was deeply influenced and inspired by Germany and by European culture and by Bismarck. Du Bois was deeply a German, a German file. So for him to take black plantation music and see it as superior to anything that, uh, that uh, uh, someone like Mozart had produced. Um, uh, 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 it was clear in his mind that, uh, that there was more to the music that comes out of the souls of black folk than the, techno than the, the European expressions uh, of Europe. His most famous book, The Souls of Black Folks, was finished in 1903. And it was deeply influenced by the experiences in Tennessee where he encountered the Fisk women and men who traveled the world singing 
from the black Harvard of the South where Du Bois first taught. Uh, all Negroes could not sing. <laughs> I, I want to I leave that out there. It was black music, but most black folk could not sing. <laughs> it was Negro music, slave spirituals, but all the slaves couldn't sing. <laughs> Just because you were a slave did not mean you knew how to sing. <laughs> but it was the honing out of that experience um, that produced uh, musical forms that are otherworldly almost. When you hear someone singing, um, uh, go down Moses, way down in Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go, or swing low, sweet chariot stop and let me ride, or sometimes I feel like a motherless child, a long way from home. This music was deeply connected to black experience. And although uh, all, uh, all of the music was for black folk, or was from black folk, all of the black folk could not sing. And, and I think we need to tell uh, that today. Because everybody thinks they can rap. Everybody who's black cannot rap. <laughs> and we need to put that word out in the hood, put it on BET, put it on uh, Instagram, wherever y'all get your information from. Everybody black cannot rap, and you need to stop. <laughs> if you hitting like 30 and you still talking about breaking through, no, get a job. <laughs> I, I, or come to Alameda and take a class here and develop your singing skills so you can sing like these four young people who presented this afternoon because I close my eyes and listen to each one of your, your, your renditions and I try to connect with you spiritually um, where you are coming from, what you are trying to teach us, what you're trying to convey. I don't think when people get up and sing they just are just going through the motions. I just don't think we have, as in America, in the West, because we've been so organized to work, that we don't appreciate the depth of the spirituality of music every day. You get up, put on your headphones, you're engaging in a spiritual experience. It ain't got to be religious, it's still spiritual. You ever been sitting around, you kind of down and out, all of a sudden your favorite song come on? I don't care who you are in this room, the oldest to the youngest, the blackest to the whitest, you know, whatever you are. Your favorite song comes on? Man, don't you light up? You just, whoo, the guy you arguing with, the arguments go away, the frustrations with your bills, just for a minute, right? Um, and, and, and I think what we have to recognize is this music is not simply performative, but it's, it's coming from someplace deep. And I think you should appreciate that in terms of uh, understanding that um, this music was uh, uh, not simply performative. Um, but the expressive culture that black people on the continent produced to Du Bois is the major contribution of music in the West. Michael Jackson is indeed as important as Beethoven. And Toni Morrison is as important as Shakespeare. And if you think I'm foolish for saying that, it's because you have been conditioned not to appreciate the production of Michael Jackson or Toni Morrison that you put Beethoven next to Michael Jackson, and outside of Western cultural mystification of Beethoven, Michael Jackson ain't nobody's joke. Anybody ever see, did anybody see his last production yeah. before he left? Remember how, you ever see that film where he's sitting around and he sounds like, he seems like he's just crazy. Uh -huh. He seems nuts talking about, nah, I don't like that, nah, I don't like that, nah, I don't like that. And then, nah, 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 in his own voice, I won't even try to attempt it. And the next thing you know, when Michael Jackson got finished telling everybody what he wanted, and when they got finished putting the product together the way he wanted it, man, it, it was like, this man is a genius. And I thought he was a nutcase. Because he let us see those sausage being made in the process of the music making. And Michael Jackson ultimately, um, I think Americans tend to not appreciate the gifts that they are given. Because we're so quick to, be, to move on to the next thing. We've already moved on past Michael Jackson like he wasn't as important. Like he was the most important musical figure of the 20th century. Or he was certainly one of them. And we don't even talk about Michael Jackson anymore. We've just sort of moved on to trap music. Now we're we talking about Bodak Yellow and Cardi B. Cardi B is more important than Michael Jackson. If she sticks around for another 50 years, she will be. Like he did. But... It's important to know the earliest expression of music was, were the plantation work songs, 
What Du Bois observed at Fisk as the source of the earliest understanding of black music formally, this is to suggest that our understanding of the music did not occur at its source. It came from Du Bois explaining what he saw at a black college as the original explanation of the yearnings of the souls of black folks. So what I'm saying is Du Bois had no book until he went to Mississippi and saw these black folks singing, and then he wrote the best book of his life. When he heard them, these people who were recently chained, their children, their daughters, their sons singing, and he never said a mumbling word, not a word, not a word. And he never said a mumbling word. Now, my name is James Taylor, so let's get that started, right? <laughs> With the, but you get my point is, when they sing, they were singing from a deep place, and was really not well taught in this country, is that when black folk were first singing in these songs, they were singing about mamas, not about Jesus. All right. That's right. That's right. They started singing about mamas first and then Jesus later. That's right. But we didn't got it all twisted up. Mm -hmm. Now, some of y'all are offended by that. But if you study the evolution of black music through the slave narratives, you see they were singing about home, about going back to Africa, about longing for mothers. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. That was more powerful. And what most people don't know, and this comes directly from UC Berkeley professor who was there when you were there, Albert Roberto, in his book, Slave Religion, that documents my sourcing to make this point that the slaves rejected Christianity. Want me to tell you again? The Nation of Islam, Malcolm X, they all lied for a long time, running around talking about Christianity is the white man's religion. That's nonsense. Black people, let me say again carefully, this is the book to read rejected Christianity for 250 years on in America. They became Christians after they were free. I should just leave right now, let y'all go to the library and see if I'm lying. Real quickly, Roberto explains that it's in the 1840s through 70s that African Americans begin to embrace the teachings of the gospel. But from the 1600s to the 1840s, nah, we don't want this because you don't even live by it. Mm -hmm. And they had their own preceding understandings of the God idea, of the deity, and of the big God, and of many, many gods. So the idea of implementing Christianity with the African ancestors, was Jesus was just another ancestor, and so was the Holy Spirit and anybody else. It all comported well with African pre-Christian experience. And Du Bois says that what is produced in America by blacks is not Christianity at all. It was a hybrid, syncretized form of black religion that was born in America. And in America, most Americans don't respect American-born religion. You'll bring Christianity from Europe. You'll bring Judaism from Europe or, or the Middle East. But call yourself a Jehovah's Witness and see if everybody don't laugh at you. Where was it born in America? Call yourself a Mormon. What did everybody do? Whoa, he's a member of a cult. Where was it born? America. Well, Father Divine, where was, he, where was his movement in, in the early 20th century? Oh, uh, uh, America, he's a cult. Jim Jones, I'm writing a book right now called People's Temple, Jim Jones in California, Black Politics. That's the book I'm writing right now on People's Temple. And Jim Jones is identified in terms of this, in this cult phenomenon. But it's also it's important to know that, that black uh, music expression um, was not originally religious per se. It was existential. It was about being lost in a lost land and trying to find your way back home to mama. And eventually that music evolves and embraces the religious idea of blacks when they become Christians, beginning with individuals, not groups, of individual men like uh, uh, Fred Douglas and Harriet Tubman. Individual black people become Christians, not the masses. The masses reject it until the 1870s. It's the black elite like Du Bois and William uh, Blyden, uh, uh, like Blyden, uh, uh, Alexander Blyden, and um, other black elites like Booker Washington eventually who emerge, who are the embracers of Christianity. But the masses don't embrace Christianity until the 20th century. Let me say this again. Do the math. 400 years in 2019, blacks will have been on this continent. I just told you out of 250 of the 400 years they were here, they rejected the religion. That their children 
and grandchildren have been Christians for a shorter period of time, less than 100 years, about 120 years, really, then their ancestors rejected it. The ancestors rejected slave Christianity for 250 years. Blacks in America have been Christians for about 120 years. So their ancestors rejected it twice as long. Y'all still got about 130 years to catch up to how long your ancestors rejected it. So my point to, to, to do this is to show you, to, de to deconstruct this, is to show you that the music they were singing was not about salvation. In the, exist, in the, in the theological sense, they were singing about freedom and, and, and uh, liberation um, in the human sense. And so the most important black the most important early figure in black life is not Frederick Douglass, but it's Harriet Tubman. Let me say this carefully. Harriet Tubman is probably the most important black person to have ever lived in America. Obama don't even put him on in the conversation. Harriet Tubman, please understand this, is the first Moses there ever was outside of the biblical Moses. The idea of a black leader was not black men leading, which you got all of these movements now going up against men and their leadership in the black movement, like Black Lives Matter, rejecting old school male leadership, and not realizing that the idea of Moses came and it was applied to one person only in American history in the beginning, and that was Harriet Tubman. She was the original black Moses of America, and not a man. And it's around her time in the 1840s through 60s, 70s that blacks begin to embrace Christianity, and then they begin to sing more about Jesus. But I'm just trying to tell you, that was a, a bait and switch that mama, Jesus, mama turned into Jesus. And then when you get to jazz, they wipe Jesus right back out. <laughs> Ain't no religion in jazz. It might be spiritual, but it was, it was completely atheistic or agnostic at the least. There wasn't no, it, it went from mama to Jesus to my baby done left me. <laughs> Mommy gone. Help me, Jesus. My baby done left me. But the, but, but, but the blues was all about the secular longing for, for these things. But it all had to do with the black condition in America and in an evolutionary way. So I got about 30 seconds left. But um, initially, the focus of, the black, of black calamity and tragedy and pain was not a desire for Jesus, God, or saviors. But the earliest black music contemplated the existential problem of slavery by calling for mothers to rescue us. It is only after slavery that black Americans become Christian. It is not true that the white man taught the slaves Christianity. The slaves rejected Christians, Christianity for 250 years. That cultural shift um, um, occurs in the 1840s, according to Albert Roberto. The G then Jesus, the Christian Messiah, gradually replaces the black Madonna or the black mamas as the object of black music. At the same time, the idea of the black leader and Exodus and Moses and Egypt become useful narratives and stories to aid and embed black people in their freedom struggles during the era of Jim Crow. Are y'all hearing me? This is some deep stuff I'm sharing with you if you really are connecting with me on this. What I'm suggesting to you is black folk used music in the plantation one way and they had their own religion. Have you ever seen the movie Beloved? When they steal away with baby, with, with, with a baby suit, when, they, when she goes and tell them down yonder, they just tear up, bind, and bruise, and chop off your hands. Love your hands. Remember that scene? In the old church, they used to call that stealing away. And black folk used to have their own religion privately, independent of it. And Harold Cruz, I just organized a conference last week uh, in, in San Francisco honoring the 50th uh, anniversary of the publication of The Christ of the Negro Intellectual. Harold Cruz's book from 1967. And Harold Cruz, more than any living black, uh, I'm sorry, he's gone. And uh, Harold Cruz, more than any scholar outside of Du Bois himself, tried to hold up the importance of black culture and said to black America, you are misunderstanding yourself and your movement. You are misunderstanding your movement and you're ruining it. Cruz suggested to black America that it needed to focus more on its cultural production, not its civil rights. Cruz said that to but culture at the fore of the black struggle also includes economics and politics. And he suggested that Martin Luther King needed more culture. 
King was deep with religion, but King did not respect black culture in mobilizing it except to use the music of Mahalia Jackson and, and you know, the ward singers and others to encourage him, but he didn't really come up with a theory, a theory of black culture. King offered you nothing of a theory of black culture as it related to who we were in the world and in the struggle, the way Du Bois says there's a soul in black folk and they're yearning to express themselves in freedom. King's um, uh, uh, appreciation for black culture comes late. When black power hits, then King all of a sudden becomes mobilized by black power and King begins to understand the role of black power uh, and becomes radicalized himself by black power. And at that time, when black power hits in 1966, after L.A. blows up in 1965 and the Panthers are created here in Oakland in 1966, the music, the urbanized music, the black music that moved uh, from the plantation to the urban context, the first music was ragtime. The first black urban music was ragtime. Du Bois doesn't even write about it because it's, it's beneath him. It's like trap music or you know the, the, the kids' hip hop music. Du Bois is like, I'm not acknowledging ragtime in my ex ex explain, explanation of black music. And it was the urban music of his time. But Du Bois wasn't feeling it. It was too low class for him. And that's the thing about all art and all, all art, especially all performative art, that we need to understand, and Toni Morrison made this clear, the rich do not perform art. It's the commoners, the, the poor people, the, the regular folk, the hood folk, who produce out of their struggle, out of their bottomness, the, the depth of their, their musical expressions, and then the wealthy buy it. Because they ain't got no talent themselves. <laughs> so I got to finish right here. Just give me two more minutes, uh, Sebastian, and I'll, I'll wrap this up. Um, because I want to make a, a couple of final points. Um, and it is to suggest that, um, again, that uh, the music, black music tradition in America, according to Du Bois, this is not my opinion, this is Du Bois' opinion. Du Bois says that black music in America is the only original music in America. That mountain music and other forms that you can find, hillbilly culture, are European adaptations and, and importations. But he sees black American Negro spirituals as the beginning of American music apart from Native American history. And you can't ignore that they had their own music before the Europeans came. So I don't want to erase their history. But I want to say in terms of the American, United States of America political entity, black music is the beginning of American culture. It's why today we still got hip hop influencing the culture. Taylor Swift is running around sound like a sister. Right? I mean, come on. Uh, Look, look at the music. Watch, watch any public expression. Pop culture is black culture. Black cultural expression is the pop cultural expression. Who dominates pop culture? You got to be kidding me if you offer anybody else. Don't, don't even try to offer up anybody else because you'll embarrass yourself. Black culture is global. It is in Europe. It is in Asia. It is all over the world, in Asia, throughout the Asian region, young Asian people reproduce black American culture and live it and mimic it, embrace it. When I was in South Africa in the shanty towns, when I took a trip of students there, we went throughout all the shanty towns and the, and the, the, the poorest of the poor living at the city garbage dump. They would run onto the trucks and take the garbage out the trucks, open them and begin eating right in front of us. And when we were going through that shanty, all up in the Chaney Town walls was pictures of, of all these hip hop artists from black America. These people were too poor to even have food in their houses, but they had black America all over. And so what Cruz argued, Harold Cruz felt like black Americans made a mistake. We let everybody else control our music but us. He said the one place where you can have a cultural revolution in America is the musical front because that's where nobody can touch you. Barry Gordy understood it. Too many, it's just, it's just too bad we didn't reproduce that mentality on a wide scale because other ethnic groups have learned how to use our music to their benefit and profit and to funding their worlds in ways that we haven't even begun to. Let me say that again. Other people have learned the lesson of the profitability of black music better than black folk have. And they are benefiting way more than the average. Jay-Z running around with a fancy Mercedes Benz should not impress you. 
unless he's making them for 45 million other black folk. The hell I care about his Mercedes or his me back. Yo, me back ain't doing nothing on my back. You ain't got my back. So I'm suggesting to you that, um, that uh, when you see black American culture, it is so powerful, the music, and we're going to move out the way so we can get some of that music right now <laughs> and enjoy it. I want to thank you for your time uh, and for your attention. I hope that I've said something that um, makes you think. And if you have a question or a comment or a thought, I'll stick around with Sylvester to be the last one here to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would encourage, right before um, Hope comes, we want to thank once again Dr. Taylor for just talking about some of the history as it relates to African American music. But I want to encourage some of you because the goal of the community college is to transfer our students. Very rarely, the community college spends a lot of time talking about CSU and UC, and we don't spend enough time talking about Jesuit universities. The University of San Francisco, where Professor Taylor is, is a great place to transfer. Consider it, email him, love him, tell people about it, and once again, let's give him another hand of applause. <laughs> Our final guest as we come, um, Ms. Hope Briggs, she's phenomenal. Uh, she was um, a finalist for the New York Metropolitan Opera. Uh, she's just a phenomenal young lady, and um, just is incredible. I'm going to let her come and let her talent speak for itself. Give her a heck of a beauty. Good morning, everyone. Is this on? I think I can, I think you can hear me, right? Yeah. yeah. Why don't you turn the switch back on? Good morning, and I really enjoyed all of the performances. Thank you all so much. Thank you for having me here. Thank you, Professor Henderson. Uh, the first piece that Phil and I will be performing is Yezu Bambino. It is Baby Jesus. The verses are sung in Italian, and the refrain is in Latin. And the refrain says, Oh, come, let us adore him, the Lord.
two spirituals um, were arranged by the Bay Area's very own Jacqueline Harrison. This is Mary Had a Baby and Wasn't That a Mighty Day. <laughs> 